Institute. If that does not sound familiar, you've gotten on the wrong airplane, and I recommend you get off right now. We're going to um, spend the next couple of days talking about the installation of the future, uh, what our Army needs to be able to train, build readiness at the installation, employ forces from the installation, and what that looks like with the revolution in technologies we've seen uh, across our society as we move forward towards this idea of multi-domain operations. So my intent for the next about five minutes just to lay out the lanes in a road for the Mad Scientist Conference as we move forward. So I think everybody signed in and uh, tonight uh, you'll get a couple reminders. We'll have a NoHo social at Marlowe's Tavern. It's just uh, right up the road on Peachtree Street. If there are any questions you have about the conference as we're going through it, you can call uh, myself, Allison Weiner, or Fred Batcher. Those are our numbers. You'll see us around. Um, Fred's the one who's pacing in the, uh, back in the background, and Allison will be sitting up here with me uh, as the conference goes forward. So here are the rules in the road. Everything we do here is unclassified. It's completely wide open. Everything is live streamed. Uh, so uh, we'll have hundreds of uh, people from around the world listening in what we're doing. And I, it is around the world. So be careful on what you're talking about. And if you, everything is proprietary, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be wide and out there because it's an international audience that plugs into these conferences. Uh, timing. We're on, a, we're, we're on short on time as we go through this. We have to stay on time. So if you are a presenter or you're just observing and learning and participating and you see me with these signs, I'm not being rude. I'm just keeping us on time. I'll be down here showing signs. If I show this one, bingo, it's time to stop, okay? As we move forward, uh, these are the signs that we use to keep us on time. Uh, microphones, uh, each presenter will leave around 10 minutes for questions, so be thinking about your questions. Our live audience is being moderated by Ian Kersey over here. He has a microphone, uh, so we'll have questions from uh, the audience that plugs in. If you have a question and you raise your hand, we'll have two microphones that will come down either side. We'll get you the microphone. Please ask your question in a microphone because it is a plugged-in international audience. They can only hear you if you're talking into a microphone. So ask your question. Be succinct uh, so that we can get as many questions as possible and that uh, the presenter can answer your question. So there's no free chicken at a mad scientist conference. When you come here, this is a spark that's supposed to move to a wildfire. That's the idea of mad scientist and innovation. Your homework is you should introduce yourself to 10 people you did not know at this conference. And it just isn't saying, hey, my name's Lee. You need to talk to them, introduce yourself. You need to tell them what you're working on. And you need to seek ways to uh, partner on what you're doing. So that's, that's the big idea here. You should walk away with, a, with 10, 15 ideas of things you can do to progress what the Army's trying to achieve here with the installation of the future. You also, part of your homework, is plugging into this uh, mad scientist network. Uh, the, we, the conferences aren't one off. There's a full program we do. We bring together an active network of expertise uh, from really around the globe that continually write for us, that are connected in with us, come to conferences to present, do online events. Uh, all of this is available and you need to plug in. Virtual attendance, if you want to look in at virtual attendance during the day, you'll see the link there. Uh, Small Wars Journal publishes our long papers. We had two uh, that, were, that were published last night. Uh, Dr. Lopers, who will present later this morning, and a team from AT&T uh, that wrote uh, a fiction piece on a garrison commander in the future. Go to Small Wars Journal, hit the Mad Science tab. I recommend you read them. Uh, they're great pieces. Uh, we have a lab. We call it a lab. It's a crowdsourcing tool. It's a blog that we have that we publish on twice a week. Uh, go check out the lab. If you're thinking about a futures topic, the place you ought to go to is that lab. Hit the search function. You will find multiple uh, articles written by the Mad Side team, by the Trade.G2 team, and by many others who are partnered into this network. It is a great tool for every one of you. All of our content from our, our conferences is on our Trade.G2 OEE YouTube site. You can look at former mad scientist events, and this event will be on in about 10 days. We're always on Twitter. 
Um, so if you're into Twitter, follow us, tweet anything in this conference. Our hashtag is hashtag Army Smart Installations. Feel free to do it. Uh, we will. And for the, this year, uh, what we've done so far and what we have planned in the future, we had a uh, bioconvergence conference in Silicon Valley. All of that content is on our YouTube page. Uh, we just did a classified conference. We do one a year at the National Ground Intelligence Center. The unclassified uh, report on that is part of the blog. If you just went into the blog and you searched uh, black swans or pink flamingos, you'd see a full lay down at the unclassified level from that conference. You, you're here at the Institutions Future. And then we have a learning in 2050 conference in August that we'll do at Georgetown, all about the future of work theory of learning, accelerated learning, augmented learning, and the tools and technologies that will help us do that. How are we going to break the 10,000 hour, uh, the tyranny of the 10,000 hour rule, which I know that some of you academics believe doesn't exist, but it's cool and Gladwell said it. So that's, that's what we'll say. Okay, so that's your, uh, your lead in uh, for Mad Scientist uh, as, we, as we move forward. Uh, so this, you know, this is a great facility and we never pay for a site. So when Mad Scientist comes and partners with an organization, at a minimum, what they're going to do is they're going to offer us to come in and they're going to partner with us at really no cost to the Army as a partnership. And Georgia Tech Research Institute has done this a couple of times for us, and uh, they provide great expertise, great uh, professionals, and a great location. Uh, so we're going to open up uh, with welcoming remarks from uh, Mr. Joe Brooks. And as you hear me introduce people, I will use a very uh, short bio, but the full bios are available at the TRADOC watch page you saw, and you can read anyone's full bio. But Mr. Brooks is the Director of Electronics, Optics, and Systems Directorate here at Georgia Tech. He has an extensive program engagements with, at Warner Robins with the Air Logistics Center, U.S. Special Operations Command, the Air Force Research Lab, Army PEO, IEWNS, Army SECOM, and NAVAIR. And, uh, sir? Uh, thanks, Lee, and uh, welcome, uh, uh, General Bingham, Mr. Kidd. Uh, welcome, welcome to everybody. A lot of uh, old faces, some new faces, so uh, I'm sure some of you, this is the first time uh, to Atlanta in a while. So uh, we're proud to be a partner with uh, the Army on this endeavor. We're a partner with the Army in a lot of endeavors, so that's uh, it's an exciting time for GTRI and the Army partnership. So uh, first of all, welcome to Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta's... Uh, a major urban area uh, I'm, uh, that is in the heart uh, or has a heart of an innovation hub. So we're right here at Georgia Tech in the uh, Midtown area. Uh, as you uh, explore Midtown, you will find uh, lots of Fortune 500, Fortune 100, and then small companies as well that form a, an innovation hub here at, at uh, Georgia Tech Midtown. So uh, we're proud to be a part of that, and uh, that's a, a growing uh, need to couple more into that type of innovation neighborhood. So uh, we've had folks like uh, Army Futures Command, uh, Amazon, and many others now looking at, uh, at this area for uh, hosting their innovation hubs of the future. So we're, uh, we're excited about Atlanta, but uh, we're also excited about Georgia Tech. Uh, Georgia Tech's a, a leading top five engineering school in the country. And uh, GTRI is uh, a major part of that, that uh, we focus on the defense side of uh, national defense uh, priorities and work closely with the Army. Uh, in particular, we uh, serve the Army as uh, your largest university-affiliated research center. So we're, uh, we're coupled into the DOD through that UARC relationship. Uh, that's a growing relationship. We've always been a partner. Uh, to the DOD, but that has expanded over the last couple of years uh, through efforts of folks like the uh, uh, AMRDAC, uh, RDAC folks. So we're proud of that. We've got a 10-year renewal on our, our UARC relationship with the Army. Uh, so we continue to grow uh, and, and impact in that area. Uh, our, our technical areas, uh, in addition to the work you'll hear from some Georgia Tech briefs this week in, in this field in particular, uh, electronic warfare, cyber, autonomy, open systems architectures, and missile defense are some key areas that we're helping the Army with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So 
Uh, you see our mission here, uh, we, if I can get this to, uh, to transition, uh, we have a national defense focus, we are the applied side of Georgia Tech. Uh, we've, we've gone more and more into prototyping new systems for the Army. So uh, the old paradigm of a, a long acquisition process is uh, largely over and we're helping to transition that uh, paradigm. So if you ever get a chance to tour Georgia Tech, uh, you know, how many GTRI folks are in the audience? Uh, would you raise your hand? Uh, maybe three or four GTRI folks. Uh, seek them out and uh, uh, tell them to take you up to lab at some point. So we'd, we'd love to have you kind of walk around a little bit at Georgia Tech and see some of the prototypes. Uh, and of course, we focus on classified research here uh, as part of the national defense uh, area. Uh, so we welcome all our visitors. Uh, We'll be participating in the conference. Uh, Trina Brennan, uh, you uh, may know, is our, uh, is our primary support. If you got any logistics questions or anything not going right, uh, 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 she's, she's the go-to person. And then, of course, we've got some Georgia Tech persist, uh, participation in the technical program, Dr. Loper and, and Dr. Lamb. So we're, we're proud to have them. So. Uh, Again, welcome to Georgia Tech. Uh, Dr. Laura Weiss is our uh, GTRI director. She's in DC today, so she, uh, sorry to miss this, but uh, sends her regards. So, uh, Lee, uh, thank you. Thanks for. Uh, uh, well, uh, <laughs> is this the only time we'll do this with this much uh, pomp? But we do want to say, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tom Greco. I'm the G2 of Training and Doctrine Command. And the Mad Sciences program is a critical component of how the Army is bringing to bear the intellect of the nation to help solve Army problems. And our partnership with GTRI is a critical part of that. Uh, if you think to the 9-11 Commission, they, had three, they cited three failures. The first was a failure of policy. The second was a failure of, of collaboration. And the third failure was a failure of imagination. So what the Mad Scientist program does is we push the limits of policy by creating a very imaginative, collaborative environment which spreads beyond just the conferences that we hold but as Lee said, the 10 people that you meet, what goes on after the conferences and outside the conferences has this ripple effect, which has had a dynamic impact on what the Army thinks about, especially what the Army thinks about for the future. And the partnership with Georgia Tech has been absolutely, absolutely critical. This is our second time here. And Richard, this is the largest the largest mad scientist event based upon the participation we've had already. It's fabulous. And you guys are great hosts. So people say, so how do I become a mad scientist? Well, you don't become a mad scientist. You must be proclaimed. So in order to be proclaimed, you need a proclamation. So if you would, Lee. United States Army Training and Doctrine Command, Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence, Mad Scientist. Whereas the Mad Scientist Initiative encourages continuous dialogue and collaboration among academia, industry, government, and non-traditional partners. And whereas the Mad Scientist Initiative identifies tomorrow's key innovations today so the U.S. Army is successful in the future operational environment. And whereas the Army Scientist Initiative supports Army learning and capability development, and whereas Mr. Joe Brooks has provided great and valuable insights and contributions to furthering the missions, goals, and understanding of the Mad Science Initiative, now therefore by virtue of the authority vested in me as the TRADOC Deputy Chief of Staff Intelligence, I do hereby proclaim that Mr. Joe Brooks be known henceforth and forevermore as an official Mad Scientist with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. Hey. May you always seek the future boldly, actively question conventional wisdom and assumptions, and passionately challenge the status quo. 
Thomas F. Greco, Deputy Chief of Intelligence, Senior Executive, Deputy Chief of Staff. Well, before we give this to you, yes. Chip, do you have the slide? There you go. So we never, re you know, we did this kind of tongue in cheek with the idea of proclamations. What we didn't realize was that it was going to be viral. In fact, Peter Singer, for example, in his official bio when he writes articles, he includes the fact that he is an army mad scientist. And, as, and these are just a handful of folks who immediately upon receipt of their mad scientist proclamation rushed to social media and posted the fact that they were now officially proclaimed as mad scientists. Now we don't expect, we don't expect that you're going to post this on social media, but we did want you to know that, that this has become something uh, this has become something worldwide. In fact, we have folks all over the world who, who have been proclaimed as mad scientists. And we wanted you to know that you were joining this elite group. So thank you very much for all your help. Thank you very much. I'm very honored. <clears throat> and there's more. All right. Additionally, we have uh, the mad scientist coin, which has the Tradoc crest on one side and the Brain on a Chip logo, which is the Mad Scientist logo, on the other. And you know the history with military coins, I'm sure. Yes, and then last, uh, we have the poster in miniature. The first time we gave out large posters and folks who had to travel um, said they had a really hard time getting it through TSA. So we've since gone to much smaller versions. But again, thank you very much for all the help, your help, and also all of GTRIs. And this is the last time we will read the proclamation, and in the future we'll, the, the thank yous will be much shorter. But given the fact that you were first, and also the, the, the tremendous gratitude we in the Army have for the help of GTRI, we wanted to make sure that we did this right. So thank you very much again. Thank you, Mr. Greco. Appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, next to kick off um, our subject today, in the next two days, uh, will be uh, Mr. Richard Kidd IV. Mr. Kidd serves as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Strategic Integration. In this role, he leads the strategy development, resource requirements, and overall business transformation processes for the office within the Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Installations, Energy, and Environment. Sir? Thanks, uh, thanks so much for the introduction, the opportunity to be here. Uh, the team who, who developed the agenda only gave me 10 minutes to talk. I guess they were tired of listening to me, but I see what we now have gained 10 minutes, so I can go for 21 minutes, which is awesome. Uh, but, you know, when you're in a compressed timeline and you don't have much time to talk, you start with the most important things first. And the most important thing is I would like to thank all of you for being here. Not only uh, do I win a bet with Tom Greco that this is the bigliest mad scientist event yet, um, but uh, I'm just terribly impressed with the quality of folks that are here. It's not all about quantity, it's about quality. I know that each of you have other things you could be doing right now, and the fact that you've chosen to spend two days here with us is important and valuable, and I appreciate that. I would also like to echo uh, the earlier remarks. This is a team effort. Uh, collaborate with your colleagues, meet new people, share ideas. You would be surprised where some of the sidebar conversations can go in terms of new programs, new business opportunities, or new friendships. I would also like to thank uh, the TRADOC G2 team, Mr. Tom Greco and his folks for allowing the installation community to partner with them. We've had a very uh, interesting and uh, collaborative partnership over the last couple of years. And we're working on a variety of things, not just mad scientists, but others, uh, other projects in the course of, um, of uh, developing a concept for installations of the future. Finally, I'd like to thank uh, the team from, from my office for all their hard work, particularly Mr. John Thompson right down here in front. Okay, so if everything works, anything of the next two days that works well, that you're engaged, excited about, impressed with, that's John's work. 
Anything that's goobed up is uh, out of sequence or not quite exciting, that's probably because I had a good idea at the last minute. And it, and it is possible to have a good idea too late. Just ask John. I've had a lot of them in the last few days. Um, I would also like to put um, this Mad Scientist event in context. So everything you hear or read about the Army is we're preparing for the future. All right? And there's realization that the rate of change is getting faster and faster and that the Army's same old way of doing things is not sufficient to keep up with the rate of change. And while you hear a lot of talk about uh, cross-functional teams and weapon systems, there's a growing realization that we also must modernize our installations. That in many ways our installations are the initial maneuver platforms as part of um, uh, uh, multi-domain operations and we must give attention to what those installations should be able to do uh, both in terms of the war fight as well as provide uh, services, public goods and services to those who live and work on them. So I've just got a few slides. I just want to set the tone a little bit. So here's the vision for the Army's uh, few installations of the future. You see that we're a maneuver platform. We place the installation in the battle space, that we contribute to readiness, resilience, as well as the um, commitment to innovation, technology, and partnerships. All right, so we are part of the future Army. So if I only had one slide, this would, would be it. So there's three major trends demanding a change in the way that we view installations. All right, in the top center is the new war fighting concept. All right, for a number of years we have conducted, we, the Department of Defense, have conducted military operations from our installations here in the United States. We've piloted, uh, remotely piloted vehicles, we've ex exercised command and control, intelligence fusion, we've deployed directly from our installations into the fight. So multi-domain operations recognizes this reality. It creates the strategic support area. And what's interesting about this is in the past Army doctrine, which is in the middle there, air land doctrine, the rear area was normally someplace else. It was Japan or Belgium or, Ku or Kuwait. That's where the battlefield ended, was someplace overseas. This is no longer the case. And you see the strategic support area. That includes the continental United States and the lines of communication to our installations for units that are mobilizing to deploy, as well as those units that are deploying from our installations. So, um, it, trivia, anyone, uh, some of you already know this. Anyway, so the last installation that was attacked on the continental United States was in my home state of Oregon, where a Japanese submarine came up from the water and lobbed a shell at a coastal artillery position at Fort Stevens, and then sailed away. So uh, we have never thought, we, we just haven't thought of our installations of being part of the battle and that has now changed. One reason why it has changed, if you look to the next, is the, is the changing threat environment. All right? We know our adversaries have the ability to reach out and disrupt the systems that we are so reliant upon whether it's our energy system, our water system, or our communication system. Cyber warfare is real and our installations are under threat and oftentimes under attack, even in this so-called time of peace. Um, and I say so-called because the, the spectrum of operations are operations less than full conflict. So uh, just a few weeks ago, the Russians have penetrated our routers, have penetrated our energy grid, have penetrated a number of systems that we rely upon. Additionally, the information warfare realm has changed quite dramatically. Uh, we, again, have seen foreign powers interfere with our elections, provide uh, false information, fake news, have disrupted and distorted uh, the American uh, political and social processes. Social cohesion has been under attack. We've also seen this tactically. We've had National Guard soldiers deploying in support of their state. We've had their personal social media accounts attacked because of their efforts. And we've had uh, service members and their families get fake or false orders, disrupting the normal process of mobilizing and deploying and moving our soldiers around. We can expect more of that in the future, as well as unconventional physical assaults. A commercial drone in the Ukraine dropping one thermite grenade on an ammunition dump uh, destroyed a billion dollars worth of ammunition, the largest sort of conventional explosion since World War II. 
the same technology is readily available and could be mastered by a teenager. As a parent of a teenager, I speak with authority on that. They could uh, absolutely master that type of technology. So uh, we see unconventional warfare, uh, information warfare, and cyber warfare are threats to our installations today, and these threats will only grow in the future. And of course, you like to say we should isolate our installations and, and just build a cordon around them in terms of, of walls and cyber barriers and these things, but that's really not a possibility. Because the third major trend is this opportunity born of new technologies. I might, smart city technologies, the internet of things are changing the way our cities interact with their citizens and the public. With this tremendous ability to design and operate communities that are more responsive to the needs of the cities, cities more responsive to the needs of the citizens, more energy resilient, uh, better preservation of the environment, integrated infrastructure that can withstand and recover from shocks in adversity, um, the ability to deliver immediately uh, information and to uh, um, web-enabled uh, public goods and services. This is what our citizens are coming to uh, expect. You're going to hear uh, later in the presentation, uh, later in the in the uh, event, some examples of what cities are doing right now. So if our, so we have a strategic issue here in the army. Is that the people that we want to recruit in the future are growing up in smart cities today? And if they're growing up in a smart city today, they don't really want to move on to a dumb installation. So we have to both prepare our installations to be in the fight to withstand the threats and to deliver the public goods and services uh, in, a, in an efficient, cost-effective manner that um, the American people want. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip that. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, the technology backbone. So what's, if we look to the future, we don't know how it's going to turn out, but we do believe that key to the installation of the future is is sort of the ubiquitous presence of sensors, the ability to move the data around between those sensors into sort of a data lake to feed enhanced decision making through artificial intelligence and human machine interface. All right. That's what we believe is sort of going to be the technological backbone. Um, and the applications that hang off of that backbone could be uh, varied. So lots of cities like Atlanta and elsewhere are doing smart city technology for traffic management and parking. We really don't have a, a big problem with finding a parking space on a, on a military installation, but we do have problems such as detecting drone overflight or securing the perimeter uh, or in terms of waste disposal or energy or smart lighting or Wi-Fi. So there are the similar applications and some different applications that will, will hang off of this, ba this data backbone that we think is so important. And if we were to sort of summarize all of this, it's not, we've got the connected soldier as part of that sensor setup, all right? And you're gonna hear more about that uh, uh, later. But imagine the soldier, we all have a sensor uh, platform, we carry it in our, in our pocket. Some of us have two or three. So the soldier is a sensor, the soldier uh, uh, data enabled, what they eat, how they exercise, uh, tailored mental and physical uh, uh, conditioning for those soldiers, and you look at the unit, you look at uh, the sleep profiles of the soldier, the sleep profile of the unit, are the soldiers, are the units able to do their job, and that's connected to an installation which is connected to the enterprise. So if we look to the future, we see this sort of connection from the individual soldier through their unit organization and installation up to the enterprise. So these are the things we're going to explore today. I'm really looking forward to taking on board your ideas and your input. Uh, as I indicated at the beginning, this is very much a team event, and your partic participation is valued. And so now, though, speaking of teams, I get to introduce our next speaker. And there's no team player, no one who's more of a team player on the Army staff than Lieutenant General Gwen Bingham. I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with General Bingham now since 2011. The smartest move I ever made was allowing then Brigadier General Bingham the opportunity to share my office because she didn't raid her own visiting space when she came to the Pentagon. So uh, uh, that, that was a smart investment on my part. But it's been a, just a real pleasure to work with her and her team. Um, 
She's had a tremendously uh, impressive military career. She's been the first woman in a variety of important general officer slots, from being the Army's quartermaster general and commandant of the, of the quartermaster school, the first female commanding general at White Sands Missile Range, which is a fascinating place. But if you, if you ever visit, hint, always turn the lights on when you go get up in the morning or go to the bathroom at night because there are scorpions, even in the DVQs. So uh, I had quite the fright with a scorpion. If you see a scorpion at 3 in the morning, you know, you really don't go back to sleep. So I was, I was, I was, I remember my visit fondly to White Sands Missile Range. She was, the, I, I digress, I'm sorry. I've still got, I'm still ahead of time though. Uh, she was also the first uh, female commanding general of the Army's Tank and Automotive and Armaments Life Cycle Management Command up in Warren, Michigan before becoming the Army's uh, Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management. She's a great leader, a great soldier, and a great colleague on this pathway to our future. So General Bingham, please come on up. Man, I'm so glad you could make it today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Woohoo! That must be the Alabama in me. Well, I must say I am delighted to be here with you, and, and uh, thank you, Richard, for that very generous introduction. Um, I tell you, it's amazing how the time flies. And Richard, uh, I, I think I almost forgot about you lending me your office in 2011, but I'm so glad you did. I'm never going to let you forget. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud to join you, uh, bring you greetings from the Pentagon, the five-sided building in Washington, D.C. Yesterday, I had the privilege to join the Association of Defense Communities at their forum, and what a great time we had. Uh, also uh, talking a little bit with colleagues on the side about this topic that we are excited to uh, participate in called Installations of the Future. I do want to thank uh, Mr. Joe Brooks. I'm not sure if he was able to stay with us, but what a wonderful institution this is, the Georgia Tech Research Institute. It's wonderful, beautiful uh, facility, and I appreciate all the innovation that goes on here. It's also great to look out in the audience and see uh, my my colleague, um, uh, Major General Retired Ron Johnson, who is also the civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army and a fellows professor here at this institute. Ron, great to see you again. I uh, want to thank my TRADOC colleagues for being here. Um, thank you for hosting this mad scientist event where innovation really runs uh, through the vein, I think, of all of us and other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Again, my privilege to join you here this morning for this event. So um, a little bit about what we do as in my role and my team back in the building as the Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management. So I'm the Principal Advisor, Staff Advisor to the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Secretary of the Army for all things that pertain to installations and inclusive of soldier and family readiness. Our mission is to provide those policies, programmatics, and resourcing for all things that, that are virtual and physical to 156 Army installations around the globe. Total Army, active component, guard, and reserve. And certainly it's our privilege every single day to enable our senior leaders' priorities of readiness, modernization, reform, and caring for our people. And so we have the privilege daily to operate with a budget of about $18 billion, sustaining well over a million, 1.1 soldiers to be exact, and 2.2 family members. So as Richard sort of established the context for installations, uh, installations are the initial maneuver platforms for our Army. They are power projection and mobilization platforms, locations from where we project people, and equipment to the needs, to meet the needs of our combatant commanders around the world. So when we talk about readiness, we enable unit readiness and improve soldier and family resilience by championing installation services where our people live, work, and train. We provide the training lands, the operational facilities, mobilization and deployment platforms, as I mentioned before, and we deploy anywhere we're called upon to do. 
Installations also serve as our home for soldiers and their families uh, and provide the facilities and environment for soldier welfare, fitness, and the leisure that enables our soldiers to focus on the fight when they are deployed in harm's way. So our portfolio supports everything on an installation, infrastructure, training ranges and land-based operational services, natural resource management, and community services. So it's a very in, in, um, diverse portfolio. We also continue to focus on energy security and resilience, ensuring that our installations can maintain continuity of operations as it relates to secure power grids and utility infrastructure, which are all critical to current operations. So our Secretary of the Army, Dr. Mark Esper, has challenged all of us to reform the way we do business in order to optimize where and how we spend all of our dollars. And so you can see and understand intuitively that our installation management universe is big. So particularly as we are growing the Army, we must be good stewards of government resources, optimizing every dollar we spend, and use those reform initiatives that help us find ways to become more efficient. So what I thought I would talk to you a little bit about before I talk uh, what we're looking at in a futuristic um, installation management enterprise are a couple things that we're doing now uh, inside of our installation portfolio. So as a part of our DOD reform initiative engineered by our Air Force teammates, uh, we are adopting the, cat the concept of category management within our facilities and our infrastructure. So category management is an acquisition uh, business model that we are applying within our facilities and base operations. And so the notion is this, if you could have a number of contracts for the various entities on an installation, so read that 17, 18 different entities or elements are on a base. If they each have a contract, say it's uh, for waste uh, uh, refuge uh, pickup, if you could aggregate that not only for the 17 separate ones, but if you could aggregate that to an installation level, the notion of category management is that we can recoup dollars by having contracts at that level whereby we would save dollars and reform. And so that's one thing we're looking at. Similarly, if you think about a single installation having contracts, imagine being able to have contracts at the regional level or even at the installation management command level. Just a way of capturing or recapturing buying power so that we in the process can become more efficient and garner dollars. So we're excited about the possibility of category management, being able to use that as we go forward. Basically the end goal is to get the best value for every dollar that we spend. Which brings me to our newest initiative, which is planning for installations of the future uh, that Mr. Kidd introduced earlier. You'll have the opportunity to meet Mr. Jordan Gillis uh, tomorrow, I believe, in the afternoon. He, he's Richard's boss. Uh, but our teams collectively are looking at installations of the future. And I must say that we're very excited about it. Uh, it's garnered a lot of interest among not only industry, but our academia partners and our members outside the gates. And so we and you who you are in this room and those online, you represent all of those partners. And I can just tell you as a former garrison commander and senior commander that I often found myself, myself saying these words, and that is there's nothing we do inside our gates without the full support and partnership of those outside our gates. Read that as our academia partners sitting here and, and those not here, uh, our industry partners and our local leaders. So installations of the future. I have a very short video I'd like to use to kind of set the context for what we are looking at in the Army now as we turn our attention toward future installations. So if you could rate, uh, run the video, please. The time of spreadsheets is over. A Google search, a passport scan, a barcode reading in a supermarket, your online shopping history, an EKG reading, CCTV footage, a photo of a sandwich, a voice message, a tweet. 
All of these contain data that can be collected, analyzed, and monetized. Supercomputers and algorithms allow us to make sense of increasingly larger amounts of information in real time. In less than 10 years, CPUs are expected to reach the processing power of the human brain. A survey done by the Global Agenda Council on the future of software and society shows that people expect artificial intelligence machines to be part of a company's board of directors by 2026. There is a good chance that in 15 years, your job is going to be performed by computers, since decisions once based on experience and intuition will be made through machine analysis of massive amounts of data. Think about a vehicle that is able to read its environment and react accordingly, much like a human driver, but also analyzing other sources of information that will make the trip safer, faster, and more efficient. Analyzing vast amounts of medical data from different locations and demographics will allow to determine which conditions improve the effectiveness of certain treatments and which don't. Big data analysis will reveal patterns and connections that will vastly improve most human activities. But it will also create very detailed profiles for all of us, including information that we'd rather keep private. Will big data make privacy obsolete? Or will it bring transparency, accountability and progress? Okay, so just to set the context, what do you think? So as we plan for our own installations of the future, and I'm talking about 2035 and beyond, uh, we know that we must change the way that we look at our installations, incorporating some of the emerging technology that was alluded to on the film strip, and to address challenges from the threats that Richard talked about earlier. Our intent is really to take full advantage of this emerging technology so that we can address these emerging uh, requirements. The use of drones, sensors, cameras, and other technologies has the potential to greatly enhance our Army's ability to provide security on installations. We believe that we must fundamentally change our culture and adapt to the future and leverage these commercial technologies, cutting edge science and, and uh, technology and feedback from our customers. And to that end, we know we must rethink our culture. So given that our culture drives uh, how we see our infrastructure and services being provided into the future, we must adapt to new ways of doing business, particularly as we prepare for our installations of the future. So just last month, Mr. Gillis and teammates at Schofield Barracks in Hawaii cut the ribbon on a 50 megawatt uh, biofuel power plant, which was the first of its kind, and I'll describe it a little bit. The Army provided the land, and Hawaii Electric Company actually built and established the power plant. And so the Army will get first call at the power uh, in the case of a natural disaster or power disruption. And so what it is intended to do is for, in the event of a natural disaster, uh, we will be able to power up the whole of Schofield Barracks, Wheeler Air Base, uh, Kenea Field Station, and even a local hospital for 30 days. It's located above the tsunami zone and the flood zone and above sea level. First of its kind, certainly in the Army, it's an islandable capability, and we see ourselves well into the future having this capability as it relates to energy security and uh, resilience. So we're excited about that project, and again, we see much more of that happening. We're very, very grateful to our industry and academia partners who have invested heavily in the Internet of Things. I think Richard alluded to that earlier this morning and we are excited about the prospect and certainly want to take full advantage of these technology. So if you think and we imagine for just a moment, and the film strip kind of alluded to that, the use of artificial intelligence uh, and smart cities technology, imagine being able to analyze real-time data and understand when a facility or a building is it going to be in need of repair. Uh, inside of our installation management enterprise infrastructure, we concern ourselves with that because, of course, that's where our soldiers and service members and families, civilians train and live in. But the notion that uh, we know that uh, dollars don't come easily, 
But uh, being able to predict when you're going to be in need of repair for a facility before it happens, that's where we want to be, and that's how we want to be able to use and analyze big data analytics. Being able to be predictive to reduce machine downtime and maintain and maintenance costs. Um, if you could think about entry onto a military installation, so access control points, being able to use a variety of advances such as biometrics and sensors. We're looking at new technologies now. We want to be able to make sure that our installations are secure. The thought of using license plate readers, uh, artificial intelligence at the edge, counter drone technology, all of these things we're looking at uh, in the near future. Uh, the Air Force, for example, recently completed a one-year rapid access pilot using facial recognition and license plate readers at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, they're currently reviewing the results of that pilot. We want to stay tied to them so that we too can take advantage of what they learn. So in February, Dr. Stan Humphreys, who's the founder of, of Zillow, he visited our team and he shared insights as to what they are doing with artificial intelligence and data analytics. And Zillow has the, uh, provided us an opportunity to use their research free of charge and we want to make good on it. Uh, we want to help inform how the Army's housing portfolio could be utilized with some of what they are learning. So again, we know that um, culture plays a large part of what we will do for our installations of the future. And I think in our own collective view, who should uh, be the better persons for us to deal with than the men and women who will use these facilities and inside of our infrastructure, the millennials, post the millennials. So we are very excited. Uh, we've teamed up with TRADOC to go to all of the centers of excellence to be able to have town halls and actually talk with our millennials and post-millennials who will use this to really get after what it is they see for our installations of the future. For sure, the days of paper phone books and wired phones and desktop computers are actually coming to, they're fading. So today's customers, they want to uh, be able to have service at their phone tips, so to speak, an app for everything. And so we know that we're going to really have to dig in and get after all of that. And each of you in this room can be a partner with us and we're excited about it. What services will our junior and future soldiers want or need for an installation to provide? What services could be provided off post rather than on the installation? Right now, for example, our child care referrals. They are all currently done online. So the question could be, can we expand, expand that to our housing referral, social interest groups, grocery delivery, and other opportunities outside of our communities? Think about it. Our going in belief, again, is that there is an app for everything, and our junior soldiers expect that or some form of our interactive kiosk in community spaces. So we want to partner with academia, with industry, to use those best practices that you have come about and divest of those missions that are not core to our Army missions. Uh, at Fort Meade, Maryland, another example, the Army took a very modern approach to its single soldier housing by privatizing apartment style dormitories uh, within our family housing complex. There, for us, the question could be, are there benefits to privatizing barracks or adopting dorm style single living uh, practices from academia, such as what is being done at William and Mary College right now today? Could we gain efficiencies, foster innovation, and promote collaboration by using some of this shared open workspaces, increasing telework perhaps, and moving clerical work to bots. I think the key to promoting this change in culture is by promoting opportunities to be more collaborative. And so we're excited about the possibility to continue to collaborate with all of our folks uh, in this internet of things or smart cities technology. 
I think uh, installations of the future, one of the things that will hold true is the partnerships that was talked about earlier. Uh, we cannot do what we do inside our gates, as I said before, without all of you outside our gates. And from where we sit, that's a good news story to being able to collaborate and take it to the next level. So we understand that partnerships magnify our collective strengths and they offset our individual weaknesses. And I think they are the catalyst for forging future capabilities. So I see partnerships continuing well into the future as we go forward. So um, as I begin to wrap up my comments, I will just say that we look forward to collaborating with industry, academia partners, local governments, and other federal parties out there for our installations of the future. And I think the sky is the limit, and that's what makes this topic very exciting for us. Um, just a few things uh, for your information. Uh, I think Mr. Gillis will make some announcements during uh, Association of U.S. Armies in October. Uh, what we're looking to do is have an industry day whereby we can have our partners come in and showcase some of the capabilities that we might consider. And then thereafter, we're looking to establish uh, a number of different pilots across the Army in the next 12 to 18 months whereby we can actually test out these new capabilities and let it mature from there. Uh, one thing I will say um, that uh, I believe now and into the future, though, our greatest asset by far is our people. I don't think we'll ever be able to uh, replace the men and women who serve this great nation in uniform, uh, nor do we ever want to find a way to try to do that, in my view. But uh, all else but that, uh, we're excited about, and uh, I look forward to your questions, should you have some for me. Thank you very much. Good morning, ma'am. Terry White, AT&T. Uh, a, a key person in our history, uh, Thomas Edison, once said that uh, he's not found failure, but he's found 10,000 ways that things don't happen to work. And he talks about being so close to succeeding, but people oftentimes back away because they're, they're afraid that they're about to fail. In an environment like the military, and we all know the military tends to not want to fail, we're, not, we're sort of risk averse, can you talk about how you can encourage your team to risk? To, or, or how can we as industry help you to accept risk? Thank you, that's a great question. But I often remember someone saying, nothing beats failure but a try. And so I think when we talk about innovation, one of the most exciting things about that is the lessons that, we can, that can be learned from it. And the only way you're going to be able to test or try out anything to be willing to fail. And so I would just tell you that in these pilots that we're looking to uh, initiate uh, over the course of the next 12 to 18 months or so, uh, we understand that uh, nothing beats failure but a try. There was an incident, as you might recall, sadly we had a fatality associated with autonomous vehicle, not, not the military, but you remember th uh, that uh, several months ago. And um, we understand that there are risks, and we're willing to underwrite that risk as we test the various capabilities. So thank you for the questions, but uh, we understand that's the best part about innovation is sometimes you have to uh, risk failure to really succeed, and we're willing to ha take those risks. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. We have an online question for you. Okay. Many of these smart technologies are bandwidth intensive. What is being done between AXIM and DISA to enable the networks of the future and strike a balance between installation level and centralized network storage and controls? Um, thank you for that. I don't know that we have gotten into a lot of uh, discussion with the network piece of it in the future. Richard, if you have something different to say, please uh, do. But uh, anything and everything that we will do as it relates to any capability, uh, you can be sure that we're going to, my words, 3C it, coordinate, communicate, collaborate uh, as we go forward. So um, I'm not sure that that really answers the question, but I would just say that it's a collaborative effort 
and it's going to be an evolving effort as we learn through uh, the futuristic state of it. Yes. Good morning, ma'am. Sam White from the Army War College. Ma'am, you Sam. talked about a fundamental change in culture. Uh, could you uh, expound on that, and, and especially the impediments, the cultural impediments you see to realizing this vision? Thank you. Yes, thank you. It's a great question. So as we, I've been in the Army almost 37 years. Um, there would be some who think that they think about the Army from when you were in the Army. And so um, in the 37 years, I will tell you that there are folks who believe that we should tear down the walls, for instance, that we shouldn't have gates around our installations, that installations should be able to ebb and flow, people come and go, we shouldn't worry about security with the gates and whatnot. And so I think that's a cultural change as to what installations now and, and, and really more so futuristically could be, could look like, should do for us. And so when I talk about culture and changing culture, we understand that millennials and post-millennials, they think differently. They are very comfortable in a digitized world, whereas folks my age, I'm almost 59 years old, or maybe not so much. And so when I talk about changing culture, I'm talking about the way we have done business and the way perhaps we're doing things now, being open to change. And so uh, just in general terms, uh, we know that, again, generations apart will think differently. So being able to uh, change that, that thought process. Thank you for the question. It's a good one. And I think we're going to learn uh, something. We're really excited to partner with TRADOC uh, to begin these town halls with millennials and post-millennials. Uh, just to find out from their uh, perspective what our installations of the future should be, what they should look like, and what, they, what capabilities and functions they would have. So uh, we're excited about what we're going to learn. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Um, my Good name morning. is Gladys Singh uh, with Precision Hawk, and as an industry partner, I'm very excited and encouraged that you are seeking innovation from industry partners such as uh, you know, my company and a lot of the folks in the room today, and uh, facilitating industry days in the future to get exposed to some of those uh, innovations and, and, and doing demonstration pilots. Um, you spoke a little bit about changing some of the procurement strategies and looking at consolidated contracts, but as a non-traditional partner, I feel that I'm always at a disadvantage compared to government contractors that have incumbency or experience qualifications or are equipped to having performed this type of work and, and we're trying to replace that with a technology application. And so can you speak a little bit about how, what some of the strategies are to change the equation and in not only invite innovation but evaluate innovation on a different level so that it could, you know, be um, scored differently and, and actually favor industry partners such as myself. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I'll speak to it only from the vantage point of what we are looking to do with our own industry day, and I'm talking from my own role as the installation management. Uh, principal staff, not really from an overarching acquisition strategy. That's what I won't, I won't talk about it from that perspective. Uh, I would just tell you to be encouraged that during our industry day, you will have an opportunity once we determ determine the date and time, or the date and location of it, to be able to uh, showcase your capability that might have applicability to us on an installation. And so uh, we haven't quite worked through all the uh, small details associated with it, more to follow, but uh, you will have the opportunity to showcase um, some of the capabilities that we know that we will be most interested in uh, as we go into the future. And again, some of that uh, capability could be influenced by what we learn from our uh, millennials and our post-millennials as we're conducting some of these off-site um, town halls. 
Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just turned 59. It's fine. fine. <laughs> I feel good about um, it. <laughs> um, Darcy Emmerman from AECOM. The Hi, Darcy. Army has led the industry in energy efficiency and renewable energy. Indeed, was so um, profound about the way they approached it that they created markets that didn't exist previously. Mm -hmm. Now as we look toward the future, there are estimates that by 2030, 30% 30 of every kilowatt hour generated will be just to manage data. So as we get into a sensor-driven world with all this additional data, where are we going to find the opportunity for the energy innovation to offset that so that we don't lose the gains in our carbon footprint that the Army has already created and not only created but set the standard for? Well, I think that's the whole notion of innovation and what we're getting to in a forum like this. So that's why we invite the company of those mad scientists that are in this room and outside of the room to join hands with us to uh, take it to the next level. So don't have the, all the answers for sure, and I think that's what makes innovation so much fun is that you get a chance to try, to fail, to learn in the process. And so uh, our journey continues. Thank you for the question. Others? Yes. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Colonel Brent Hyden, OSD Business Reforms. I'm... Uh, I noted earlier, Mr. Kidd, I think, made the statement, the rate of change in our world is increasing, and our, our processes need to evolve to support that change. As you know, we have a lot, of, a lot of great ideas, and certainly we'll talk about those over the next couple of days. Um, we have a lot of demonstration projects which we pursue throughout the DOD, and I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on how we jump beyond demonstration projects to institutionalizing the, the great ideas that, that we can come, with, uh, come up with. Is it process policies? Are there ways to completely redo how we, how we implement, how we transform uh, the DOD. Mm -hmm. Just like your thoughts, please. I think it's a fair question. I think you know that we compete uh, in our funding. Uh, and boy, I wish we all had an endless pot of money. So we understand, first of all, we're going to have to prioritize uh, that which we do. And so oftentimes when I've talked to my OSD counterparts, uh, they are looking at very much not only uh, cost savings and efficiencies, but also return on investments. And so that's an important part of the ingredient. So I think it uh, starts first from understanding the capabilities that exist or can exist to advance our portfolio and really give us best bang for the buck, if that makes sense to you, and to uh, go for from there to be able to prioritize uh, those uh, emerging initiatives that we're going to take on. We understand that we, we won't be able to you know, do uh, everything at one time. And so we're going to have to look at it from a standpoint of uh, prioritized uh, return on investment, I think, at the end of the day. But thank you for your question. Thank you. Thanks so much. First of all, ma'am, I lived at White Sands Missile Range for three years. I saw I mountain it. lions, coyotes, tarantulas, but I was never assaulted by a scorpion in my bathroom. <laughs> So I didn't have the experience that Mr. Kidd, must be only the DV, uh, uh, the quarters on Tuelli or wherever I lived all those many years ago were, were not being attacked by uh, scorpions. So uh, this is your proclamation. You heard all about it. Thank you. Uh, on that list up there, uh, there, was, there were no general officers on that list. We're going to have to redo that on that, there, on that slide. We might have to redo the slide. There was a Stanford Ooh. professor. <laughs> there was somebody from Finland's version of DARPA. I can't pronounce it because it's a bunch of letters that we don't put together, put together. <laughs> um, there were a couple of think tank individuals, but, uh, but uh, not, a, not a general officer. So there have been a couple of other before you, but we, we need to get one up there. So th you're being proclaimed as a mad scientist. Uh, forget up here and talking to us about mad ideas and taking mad questions. <laughs> and, um, and thinking about the future and leading our Army into the future. Thank you, Lee. And then um, our, the Tradeout G2 coin with the brain on there. Thank you. And then here's our, uh, the frame for our picture that you saw 
um, out when you came in uh, commemorating this event. Thank you so much. Thank we you. Appreciate you. Thank you. The, uh, there, the, there were some great questions leading off, and it, just to, um, to lead you to a couple of resources, Boston Consulting Group just recently did a small article that was talking about um, traditional defense industry and how, what would have to change for the Army and for DOD to innovate forward, uh, which meant it would have to include more of the non-traditional uh, industry partners, or Boston Consulting Group was talking about that, because where the expertise might not be in our traditional big defense industry. We might need to be more inclusive to the broader piece. I would say anybody wanted to go look that up, you would just Google Boston Consulting Group and kind of DOD innovation uh, transformation, industry transformation. You'll probably come up. It's worth a, a quick read. And then uh, definitely as uh, in the Mad Sci blog, we've talked and written about prototype warfare and the idea of prototyping, rapid prototyping, being in a loop with an adversary prototyping. Uh, and you see that on, at our installations, you'll see that forward in the future, uh, but a key piece will be at determining which of those prototypes are successful and what needs to be scaled up. I think the idea, first of all, is don't require something to scale initially, drive towards prototyping, see what works, and then move forward. Uh, but the quick question before you've even prototyped is, how does this scale up to half a million uh, man army or soldier army? Uh, basically, a lot of times kills the innovation. So, there's a balance there, and that was a great question that we had to think about. The prototypes that we develop and the ones that succeed, how do we scale that? When do we scale that? Do you scale that? Is it required? These are all great questions.